This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. All right, we're continuing now with contract law, and I did promise that I would say, don't even think about trying to remember case names. Please, don't anybody ask me again on the Ask ACTA Tutor Forum, do I have to remember all these names? No, you don't. So we're into acceptance now. Remember, we're talking about a contract, contract law, and a contract is an agreement supported by consideration made with intention to create legal relations. And an agreement has got two parts, and there's sometimes a third element, isn't there? There's the invitation, followed by the offer, followed by the acceptance. Now, we just dealt with offer in the last lecture, so now we're looking at acceptance of this offer. The invitation is gone. Once the offer is made, once the invitation has been accepted in terms of and it has resulted in an offer, we're no longer interested in that invitation. But now we're in, we have the offer, now we're looking to accept that offer because that, the combination of those two, will give us that agreement. We will consider how that is supported by consideration. We shall consider whether there was intention to create legal relations. But at the moment, I've already gone through the offer, now I'm going to look at the acceptance, and that's the other half of the agreement. Acceptance must be complete and unconditional. Well, of course it must. If I make you an offer, well, a silly example, if I make you an offer to sell you my house, you can't say, yes, okay, but I only want to buy the bedroom. You can't accept part of an offer. If I sell you a car, or offer to sell you the car, yes, I accept, but I only want three of the four wheels. So, it, acceptance must be complete and unconditional. And if it's not, if you try to put in a condition, if you try to change the terms of my offer in any material way, and it has to be material, in any material way, then the effect of that is that you've rejected my offer, and you've come up yourself with a counter-offer. So, acceptance must be complete and unconditional, subject to immaterial change, but nothing major. The acceptance cannot vary the original offer, that would be a counter-offer, and there was a case about a helicopter sale, Northland Airlines and Dennis Ferranti meters. The Ferranti was selling a helicopter, Northland Airlines wanted to introduce two new terms. Yes, okay, we accept, but we want delivery in 30 days, and we want to pay it not into this specified bank account, we want to pay the money into a different bank account. Well, they, they varied the terms in, an, in a material way, and so they rejected by their variations, they rejected that original offer and had made a counter offer, which Ferrantimeters chose not to accept. The offer must still be open, of course, it must, it mustn't have been rejected. Remember, in the first lecture on contract law, uh, I invited you to make me an offer £500 for my car, you came back with 300 I said 400 you said 350 enough, enough, I'm having no more of it, I don't want to hear from you again, I'm not going to sell you my car. So rejection, that the offer is no longer open. What if you then say, okay, I'll give you the 400? Well, I've already told you. Once you say 350, you've got rid of my offer of 400, my counter offer, which was 400. You scrapped that. You made your offer of 350, and I said no. So now there's no offer on the table. So there's no offer at all available. You can't turn around and say, okay, I'll give you the 400. Nope, gone. Acceptance must be communicated to the offeror. But the offeror may waive their right of communication. Carlyle and Carbolic. I told you, Carlyle and Carbolic keeps cropping up time and time and time again. Where the offeror advertises a reward, it's called, they're called reward cases. If the offeror makes an offer which is tantamount to the offering of a reward, then they offer all waives their right of communication and acceptance. May be communicated by a reliable third party, the acceptance. 
Remember, revocation could be communicated through a reliable person, through a reliable third party. We had the case Dickinson and Dodds. Well, now here we have acceptance being communicated by a reliable third party, Powell and Lee. In fact, in Powell and Lee, it was not acceptance. It was claimed that it had been accepted by a reliable third party, but the court said, no, this particular instance, the reliable third party was not a reliable third party was not, he was acting without authority and therefore was not a reliable third party. But the court said there's no reason why acceptance could not be communicated by a reliable third party. Silence can't be acceptance. This is a nice case. I like this case. The case felt house and bin list about an uncle and a nephew. And the nephew is selling up, he's selling everything in the UK and he's going to go and live abroad. So he, he puts everything into the hands of the auctioneer, except the horse. He had a horse, and he can't put that into the hands of the auctioneer because the auctioneer doesn't want to be looking after a horse. So he gives it to his uncle for safekeeping and says, uh, will you look after it, uncle, for me, please? And the uncle did, and he fed it, and he groomed it, and he exercised it, and he washed it, and he fed it, and stabled it, and, and he, he felt quite heavily for this horse. It was a lovely horse, wonderful beast. So he wrote to his nephew and said, um, I've been looking after this horse and I think it's a super animal. Uh, I'll offer you a hundred pounds for it. If I don't hear from you, I'll take it that the horse is mine. Well, the nephew never responded. So the uncle said, okay, I'll take it that the horse is mine. I have made an offer and he's accepted because if I don't hear from you, I'll take it that it's mine. But the horse was on the auctioneer's list and the auctioneer went and sold it. And the, the uncle said, you can't have sold this, that's my horse. See, I've written to my nephew, said, I love you hundred pounds. If I don't hear from you, I'll take it, it's mine. I've not heard from him, so it's mine. And the court said, well, no, you can't impose acceptance or rejection on another person. Can you imagine? Can you imagine ringing up and, and this tearful widow of mine and tells you that I'm dead. And so you go along to the cemetery and said, Mike, I'm going to offer to buy your house, 300 pounds. If I don't hear from you, I take it, it's mine. And nothing comes from the grave. Thanks, Mike. And you claim the house. Clearly, that's nonsense. So you cannot impose a responsibility on the other party. And you can't make the nephew say, yes, okay, uncle, or alternatively, no, uncle, I'm sorry, I want to sell it. So silence cannot be acceptance, it has to be positive communication. Acceptance may be by conduct, the case Brogdon and Metropolitan Railways, I'm not going to go through it, but the, the, the two parties conducted, or the one party particularly, Brogdon, conducted himself as though he were in contract, and Metropolitan Railways didn't object until later, and then said, no, no, we're not in contract, therefore we're going to scrap, we don't want any more of your goods. And, and he said, but you've been accepting my goods by your conduct, you have accepted the services and goods that I have provided. And therefore we are in contract, and therefore you must obey the terms of the contract. This was the basis of one of these past exam questions where you had to write a 10 mark essay, 10, yeah, 10 mark 18 minute essay. Once the acts of acceptance have started, you cannot go back and revoke your offer. And the, the case that was in the, the, the case to quote is the case Errington and Errington, but of course you don't need to know that. But it was a nice story that the examiner said to him. And he said that the group of guys were sitting at um, an outside table of a cafe uh, by the side of a harbour in Cornwall, in the deep southwest of England. And uh, behind them at a table was a group of loudmouth youths. And one of them said to the others generally, he said, uh, I'll pay a hundred pounds to anybody to swim across the harbour. And the first person to swim across the harbour, I'll give a hundred pounds. Well, nobody at the next table where our hero was sitting. Nobody said anything, but they heard this offer being made. And then shortly after, a child fell into the harbour 
on the other side of that room, a narrow entrance way, fell into the harbour on the other side. And our hero jumps up, takes off his jacket, and dives in, kicks off his shoes and dives in and starts swimming. Well, Loudmouth from behind gets up and says, don't think I'm paying you £100, I'm revoking my offer. But of course, the acts of acceptance have already started. And it was a reward case, so the offer all waives the right of communication, Carlyle and Carbolic smoke ball. The offer was made to a world at large or anyone that had heard it. In order to accept an offer, you must be aware that the offer exists. You don't need to be uh, in the position where you have to reply. So long as you're aware that the offer exists, that is enough. And our hero was aware because he'd heard it. And therefore, when he dived in and started the acts of acceptance, that was good acceptance. And you can't revoke an offer once the acts of acceptance have already started. Now, I was asked a question on the forum. Uh, did the child survive? Was the child successfully rescued? It's, it's irrelevant. The point of law is not, were these acts sufficient to save the child? I'm sorry for the child, but it was only a story. It was only a story made up by the examiner. But it's irrelevant. The principle is that for acceptance to be good, the acceptor must be aware of the office existence. The postal rule applies. Just let me go down here. Acceptance must be made within a reasonable time. Ramsgate, Victoria, Hotel and Montefiore. The offer to buy shares. Six months have lapsed. The offer wasn't accepted. Therefore, the acceptance from the, the company, Ramsgate Victoria Hotel, was not made within a, a reasonable time. So the uh, acceptance has to be made within a reasonable time. Now let me go back to postal rule. Postal rule says that once acceptance is put into the postal system, properly stamped and addressed, and postal acceptance was in the reasonable contemplation of both parties, as being an acceptable medium, then acceptance is good the moment it goes into the postal system through the proper channels. That is, through that little channel at the top of the post box, basically. Once you put it into the postal system, that's the moment that acceptance is made. And if it's lost in the post, no problem. It's still good acceptance. How do you prove it? Well, now there's a problem. In olden days, when I was a trainee auditor accountant, companies, client companies, used to hold and used to maintain a postage book where they listed out every envelope that was mailed to clients and they would put them the date and the addressee and very, very brief details of what was in that, that letter and, and the value of the stamp that was affixed to the envelope. So postage books were deemed to be good enough proof that that letter had been posted, even though it was lost in the post. It was good enough proof of being uh, having been posted. But I don't know that companies these days do maintain postage records. But if they did, then the postal rule would apply. Acceptance is effective from the moment that it's put into the postal system through the proper channels properly stamped and addressed, and both parties must have thought that postal acceptance was an appropriate medium of acceptance. If you go into a shop and you're browsing, a gallery, and you're browsing, and you say, oh, I like that painting, and they look at the price, it's 2000 and you think, hmm, a bit too much prepared to offer, I'll offer a thousand to the shopkeeper and the top shopkeeper says, I tell you what, give me five, give me 1500 and you still think it's a bit much but then you think to yourself, well, I might as well, I'd rather do like the picture but you're pulled away on business so just before you go, you write out, say yes I accept the painting and I'll pay you 1500 you put it into an envelope, put a stamp on, proper stamp address put it into the postal system. It arrives three days later. Now, postal rule says that once you've accepted it, that's the time of acceptance and so we're in a contract. But only 
if both parties thought that post-like acceptance was an appropriate medium. Now, when you're face to face with a shopkeeper and you're given the opportunity to make your decision sometime later, when you're face to face with the shopkeeper, your shopkeeper is not going to be thinking, hmm, I wonder if they'll drop me a line sometime next week to tell me that they're accepting. You're face to face, you accept face to face communication of acceptance, not postal acceptance. So in a situation where you're face-to-face -face like that, then you would uh, reject the concept of postal acceptance being appropriate. Furthermore, if the shopkeeper says, I'll give you five days to think about it, and you go away and you're within this five-day period, and meanwhile, after two days, the shopkeeper, somebody comes along and says, I like that, I'll pay you 2000 for it. And the shopkeeper sells it within the five-day period. And that period is called an option period. And so you go along at the end of four days, for instance, and say, yes, I'll buy it. I'll buy it for £1,500. And the shopkeeper says, I'm sorry, I sold it. And he said, but you gave me a five-day option period. In order to be able to enforce that option period, what did you give in exchange? The shopkeeper gave you a time period within which to make up your mind. What did you give in exchange for that time period, that option period being granted to you? Some right, interest, profit or benefit according to one party. That's you being given some right, interest, profit or benefit. What did you give in exchange? Nothing. Then you can't enforce the option period. So acceptance must be whether a postal rule applies, we've just covered that now. Household fire insurance company and grant, acceptance was placed in the post and therefore it was effective from the moment it was placed into the postal system. Properly stamped and addressed through the proper channels and both parties must have thought that postal acceptance was an appropriate medium. Consideration. Every contract must be supported by their consideration. Remember, a contract is an agreement, supported by consideration, made with the intention of creating legal relations. That's the definition. Now we've looked at offer and acceptance, that's the agreement. So now we're into supported by consideration. It will be good to know what is meant by consideration because consideration is a fundamental necessity for simple or parole contracts. Um, where do we have parole? Do we have parole? Yeah, a simple parole contract. A simple contract is distinct from a specialty contract. Not a, not a speciality, a specialty is the, the word. And it's um, a specialty contract then is a contract which is made under seal. It's stamped, properly stamped and addressed, a deed. For instance, if I promise to give you 300 euros and I expect nothing from you in return, I'm just giving you, I promise to give you 300 euros and then I don't. Can you sue me? Well, you can, but you would not be successful because you didn't give me anything in exchange for my promise. So unless I sign, seal and deliver it in front of witnesses, I hereby promise to pay you £300 in the presence of witnesses and, and it's signed by me and it's signed by the witness with their name and address and the date and it's sealed, properly stamped and may be witnessed by a Citizens Advice Bureau or some notary. Unless it's gone through that rigmarole, you can't enforce my promise of 300 against me. So that would be a specialty contract. As a contract which requires only one way of consideration. It can be two. I promise to give you 300 and you promise to do something for me in exchange. Fine. That, that will be two way. That would that be a simple contract. Simple boom, boom, boom. But a specialty contract, one way, on the needs one, it may have to. So sign, seal and deliver contract, one way consideration is all, all that is necessary. Korean Misa is an 1875 case. The case name is not important. Case year is not important. So it's an 1875 case. 
And Karim Misa defined what was meant by consideration. It's necessary because a contract is an agreement supported by consideration made with intention. And Karim Misa definition is this. I've taken the opportunity to write it out for you so that you don't sit there watching me write it. But it's some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some loss, detriment, responsibility or forbearance given, suffered or undertaken by the other. And that's what consideration is if you think about it. Some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to you or looking at it from my point of view it's some loss, detriment, responsibility or forbearance that I have either given, suffered or undertaken. So we can reduce this long-winded expression and we can say that consideration is something of value and that is important. Consideration has a value. It must be sufficient, remember this, it must be sufficient to merit the title consideration. It doesn't have to be commensurate. It doesn't have to be the same value as my car is actually worth £3,000. But you've offered and I've accepted that you will pay me £350. It, £3,000 is its true value. But you've offered £350. And I've accepted saying I give you, I'll transfer my car to you. My car has a value, your offer has a value, and that's all that is necessary. It does not need to be adequate. Consider, remember, consideration must be sufficient to merit the title consideration. It needn't be adequate. So Kiri Amiza defines it as some right, interest, profit or benefit accruing to one party or some loss, detriment, responsibility or forbearance given, suffered or undertaken by the other. Now apparently, and I'm not smart enough to work this out, I have tried, maybe you can, apparently that does not deal with the situation of a promise for a promise. If I promise to do something for you and you promise to do something for me, apparently the Korean Mesa definition doesn't cope with that situation. So in the case Dunlop and Selfridges, we have an alternative definition, which I always find a bit of an anomaly. How can you have two definitions of the same thing? But anyway, we have this alternative definition in Dunlop and Selfridges that says, an act of forbearance by one party, or the promise thereof, is the price at which the promise of the other is bought. And a promise thus given for value is enforceable. Now that apparently deals with the situation of a promise for a promise. And yes, I can understand. I don't understand why Korean Misa doesn't cover the situation of a promise in exchange for a promise. But there you have it. You will not be asked to remember these definitions. It just is not going to happen. You will not have the opportunity to demonstrate because by consideration is meant um, an act of forbearance or the promise thereof. It won't happen. Consideration is any right, interest, profit or benefit to go into one party or some lost detriment, responsibility or forbearance given, suffered or undertaken by the other. You will not have the opportunity to write those out in F4. Executed. Executed, we talk about consideration that is executed and consideration that is executory. Executed means finished, it's done, it's gone. So car and, and 350, if you have paid me the 350 and I have yet to deliver the car, your consideration is executed, my consideration is still executory, mine is still to be completed. If you have paid and I have delivered, your consideration is executed and so is my consideration is executed and the contract is complete. If I have delivered and you have still to pay, then mine is executed and yours is still executory. What Dunlop and Selfridges is I promise to deliver and you promise to pay then an act of forbearance or the promise thereof is the price to which the promise of the other is bought. And a promise that's given for value 
is enforceable. And your consideration is still executory. And my consideration, the Dakar, is still executory. Okay. Here's one. Past consideration is no consideration. Something that you have done in the past is gone. It's finished. It's over. So you can't use something from history to support a claim for compensation now. And the case of McCarthy is probably one of the saddest cases in English law. I'll tell you about it because it does illustrate this concept of past consideration is no consideration. Ross Goller and Tom's is a fun case. Uh, about a horse. But Reem McArdle is about um, a son and his wife and they're going to visit her mother-in-law, the son's mother. And they go to visit her and, and the conditions in which she's living are phenomenal. There's dirt, there's damp, there's the roof is leaking, there's cold and bitter, there are rats running around. It's a the kitchen is filthy, the bathroom stinks. And she says, I can't stay here. Like the, the daughter-in-law says, I can't stay here. This is awful. And I can't, I will live in a nearby hotel and stay in a but I will change it. I will I will take your mother's property in hand and I will get it sorted out. You can't, you can't stay, she says to her husband. You go back home. You've got work to do, you've got to go to work on Monday. I don't. I can take time off. And so she did. And she repaired the roof first thing to stop it leaking. And then she chipped off all the plaster from, replastered it, threw out the old bathroom, put in a new bathroom suit, and the kitchen all gone, oxed out, gone. New kitchen, new bathroom. She threw out all the damp and rot rotted carpets killed all the rats and the mice and killed the cockroaches and the beetles and sprayed the ants nests and cleaned it up. She painted it, she decorated it, she put new curtains up. All of this cost her over 800 pounds. I know, it's a long time ago. It cost her over 800 pounds. And she just put in the finishing touches, the very, very last few brush strokes of, of paint on the skirting board behind the door and the door opens and in walk, her brother and sister, she just finished it, just puts the paintbrush back into the white spirit to clean it. And the brothers and brothers and sisters in law said, God, Lord, Mum, who's done this? This is fantastic. Who on earth has done this? Last time we came to see you, you were living in squalor, and now you're in palatial surroundings. Amazing. This little voice from behind the door said, it was me. I did it. And they said, you're an angel. What a sister-in-law we have. We're so lucky to have you as our, in our family. I tell you what we'll do, they said. When the old lady dies, and she's sitting there in a rocking chair, the old lady. When the old lady dies, we'll dedicate the first 800 pounds, or however much it costs you, we'll give you, we'll repay you out of the estate to compensate you. And then we'll share the rest amongst us. And the old lady died. So no more rocking on the rocking chair. I can stay still now. The old lady died. And the executor, the administrator of the will, the, sorry, the administrator of her estate, because she didn't leave a will, the administrator of her estate, got all the property, all the money, and the estate values together, sold the house, got it all together, and he's going to now divide it into five sections. Three for the daughters, two for the sons, and she says, Oh, whoa, 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 you promised that you'd give me the first 800 pounds and then you'd divide it. And the administrator didn't know what to do because, according to the laws of intestacy, it has to be divided equally amongst the, the children. So he went to court, the administrator went to court, and the court said, Well, why was this promise of 800 pounds given? She said, because I've just spent all my, my own money repairing the house, the, the electrics, the plumbing, the roof, the carpets, the kitchen, the bathroom, the decorating. I'd spent £800 of my own money. When did you receive this promise? She said, I can remember exactly when I was behind the door, just painting those last finishing touches to the skirting board. 
And the court said, you mean you just finished when this promise was received? Yeah, just, just finished. So the work that you had done, for which you are now claiming £800, was complete and history. And she said, well, yeah, I suppose it was. And of course, all past consideration is no consideration. So what you have done is gone. What have you now done since that you can claim this £800? And the answer is nothing. Isn't that a sad case? But, Rima Cardle, no need to remember the case. Just remember the principle of law. Past consideration is no consideration. Consideration must be legal and possible. If I were to offer to pay you £900, no, I'll make it a thousand, a nice round figure, a thousand pounds to kill my sister, and you go and do it, and now I refuse to pay. Can you sue me? Well, can you imagine going to court? <laughs> can you imagine going to court? Say, you're off. He offered me a thousand pounds to kill his sister. I have killed her, and now he won't pay me. No, the principle is the same. Consideration is two way. My promise of a thousand, your promise to kill my sister, yours is not legal, and therefore it's not consideration. So we don't have a contract, so I don't have to pay you. Consideration must move from the promise C. The concepts of privity of contract. Now, there's going to be more on that in a moment or two. And consider, of course, may imply a promise to pay a reasonable sum. An implied consideration. A lovely case called Lampley and Braithwaite about two prisoners in Newark jail. And one was about to be freed and the other was about to be hung. And the one about to be hung said to his friend, can you go to the king and see if you can get me a king's pardon, rescue me from this hanging fate? So he did. He wrote down to London and he said, knocked on the king's door and said, Will you give me a king's pardon for my friend in Newark jail? He's about to be hung. So the king said, yeah, all right then. So he rode back to Newark just as the noose was going around his head. And he said, I'm here, I'm here. I've got the king's pardon. And the crowd booed because their entertainment for a Sunday afternoon was taken away from them. And they had these two adjourned to the local tavern. Now, having a drink and said, well, what about paying me a hundred pounds then? And he said, well, I know I might have promised you a hundred, but hey, come on, I can't afford it. And I'm sorry, he didn't promise a hundred. Uh, he, he sued, the one who'd done all the writing and all the work sued and said, can I have a hundred pounds for my trouble? Because I stole a horse and I'm now facing prison term myself. Can I have a hundred pounds? And he said, no, 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 no. no. I, I did say I'd see you right, but um, I just bought you a beer and, and that should be sufficient. And the, it went to court, these two went to court. And the court said, no, I'm going to imply a promise to pay a reasonable sum. We think in the context of your life or being hung, we think um, £100 is a reasonable sum. So the court may imply a promise to pay. But it's unusual, so it's going to be a rare occurrence. It's just illustrative of a, of a long ago case, maybe three, I can't, don't remember the date. You don't need to, need to know, but it must be two or three hundred years ago. Um, 